Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. Today we're going to explore the idea of cause and effect in the context of an important idea, mass criminalization, or as we like to call it on the show, blanket criminality. That's because we've learned some new information about a troubling trend in law enforcement that does not hew to conventional wisdom. And we've also obtained data which reveals just how money profit and criminality are inextricably linked. But first remember, if you have evidence of police misconduct, please email it to us privately at par at therealnews.com and please like and share and comment on our video. You know I read your comments and I appreciate them. Now let's start this show with a scenario that plays out every day across this country and use it to make a point about incarceration and law enforcement as often overlooked. So imagine you're a police chief of a small, relatively rural town. You're not only the nexus of the area's criminal justice system, but also in a sense of business. You might be one of the area's largest employers, and the salaries and benefits you offer are rare in the communities you purport to serve. In fact, let's just say your town has experienced a loss of both jobs and investment that has become common in rural America. But as the chief, you have a problem there's just not that much crime. That is the basic purpose of having all these cops on salary, driving around in expensive SUVs doesn't exist. That's because for the most part, crime has been falling. And even more dicey is this, part of what fuels the growth of your agency across rural America are federal grants, big chunks of money that pay for price benefits and relatively high salaries. The problem is though, these grants require you generate stats, meaning arrests, to keep the money flowing. Making matters more complicated is just down the road from your police department is another employment center fueled by criminal justice, a prison or a jail. That expensive facility is filled with hundreds of beds that need bodies, or more accurately, citizens to fill them. The problem is though that based upon national statistics, there just aren't enough people offending. And even worse for you, in your neck of the woods, there's barely any serious crime at all. All of this puts our hypothetical police chief in a vexing position and illustrates what's fundamentally wrong with our country's expensive law enforcement industrial complex. The chief is stuck in a classic supply and demand dilemma. Everything that sustains the enterprise demands criminals. The need for bodies to keep the assemblance line of vengeance humming requires wrongdoers. Every facet of his so-called business demands deeming a set number of citizens offenders. So what does he do? How does he solve this vexing dilemma? Well, here on the Police Accountability Report, we have part of the answer. That's because for weeks, we've been documenting a phenomena that relates directly to the so-called chief's dilemma. First, for those of you who've watched our show, you would be familiar with this, an endless string of absurd arrests. That is an ongoing litany of detentions for non-criminal infractions that has continued unabated. We spoke to guests across the country who have been arrested for holding a sign, playing a guitar, riding a bike without a deflector, or checking for the Americans with Disabilities compliance in public buildings. I can go on and on. The point is this, this procession of fraudulent and frivolous magic handcuffs is exactly what you would expect to happen given the aforementioned scenario I just recounted. With a shortage of criminals and an excess of jail beds, you have an industry with excess capacity and it manufactures demand. And that means more of these, simply put, manufactured arrests. But that's not where the story ends, because we even have data to back up this theory, and it points to an even more interesting correlation between the parade of bad arrests and ramping up our criminal industrial complex. For more on this, I'm going to my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who's in the field. Stephen, what else have you learned? Hey, Taya, I am here in Annapolis, Maryland, where criminal justice reform goes to die. Right back here is where they make all the decisions about preventing things like sentencing reform and what we're going to be talking about today, a little bit about, about expungement. But before I do that, I want to talk about a statistic we just learned that you might find interesting and relates to some of the reporting that we're doing, and that is that mass incarceration has seen its greatest increase in rural parts of America. If you look at the graph we have on the screen right now, you'll see that mass incarceration has actually gone down in urban areas and suburban, but it has grown exponentially in rural parts of the country. Basically, what, you're, what we're seeing is something along the lines of what we've seen with the auditors, which is that mass incarceration and the use of prisons is becoming a bigger tool in the rural parts of the country where many of these auditors operate. Now, Steve even we covered a situation where a rural police chief on Maryland's eastern shore pushed back against rural mass incarceration. 
What happened to him? That's an excellent point, Ted. What we saw in Pocomoke was that a police chief who said, hey, I'm not going to arrest everybody who, who fought back against the Worcester County Drug Task Force. He used to come into his town and arrest people en masse for the war on drugs. What happened to him was that the criminal justice complex in Maryland came after him and indicted him for a 2014 accident involving two parked cars. So basically, while they tried to make it out to seem he was corrupt, the basic conflict here was he was trying to prevent mass arrests. He was trying to prevent the kind of stuff that we're seeing now across the country with auditors, trying to prevent people from being arrested for nothing, having their lives ended by the criminal justice system, and the justice system retaliated against them. Now, you've also been covering a wide range of criminal justice reform ideas, but of course, Maryland is a blue state, a Democrat-run state, but these reforms have a tough time. What is going on? That's a great question. What they're working on down here in Annapolis is something called unit expungement. In other words, if you are charged with six crimes and you are found not guilty of five of them, what prosecutors here want to do is maintain those crimes on your record. They want to keep them as a permanent sort of scarlet letter. And what activists down here are trying to do is fight against that. Let's see what people had to say. We talked to a couple of people who are advocating for this expungement bill. Let's see what they had to say. Uh, it's a personal thing with me. Um, when I got out of prison in the late 90s, I did. I had a charge of two felony thefts. It's a theft over three hundred dollars, not a violent felony. And uh, I wanted to do the right thing. You know, I got out of prison. I wanted to just do the right thing. But it was so hard to get a, a a real job because during that time and now it took ten years to get your expungement off. So I got depressed. I'm making five fifteen an hour when I could be making twelve or thirteen with benefits. Got depressed, I started using again, ended up being homeless. So Taya, the bottom line is down here that the efforts to reform the criminal justice system, to take away that scarlet letter, um, is not probably going to be successful. More than likely, people will have to keep these things on the record, even though they were never convicted of a crime or found guilty. It's an extraordinary thing, but you can see as you walk around Annapolis that there are police officers everywhere, that there is a criminal justice industrial complex which enforces these types of rules to keep people in abeyance of this system. Back to you. Thank you so much for reporting in the field for us, Stephen. And so to delve deeper into the details and what this increase in rural incarceration means for the people who live with it, I'm joined by someone with firsthand experience with law enforcement in small communities. Out of the Watchdog has already been a guest on the show. He's an auditor who's been arrested for what would seem like, in another world, a perfectly legal activity like holding up a sign or giving away food. And that case illustrates what we're going to talk about today. Otto, welcome back to the Police Accountability Report. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I want you to share one of your experiences dealing with small police departments. I believe you were harassed and even arrested by police for giving away food. I believe it was potatoes. Can you tell me about uh, your experience? Yeah, so I was, uh, I had been giving food away for a while, uh, usually just like small boxes that you just kind of hand out. Um, but I, I came across a, a great opportunity to, to get a truckload of potatoes and carrots. Uh, so, um, I didn't know what to do with them. So I just gave, just went out and, uh, gave as many as I could away at, at one time. Uh, but the, the, the police, uh, the chief of police told me that as I was on my way to her town, this, uh, the poorest town in the state of Texas, um, that I would have to, to wait until Monday and get a permit. Uh, and I just so happened to have a sign in, uh, in the back of my truck, uh, that was very fitting for this situation. <laughs> I can imagine you have some great signs. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. So what? So what exactly happened? We have some of the video that we can show, but were you? Um, what? What happened? How, what did the police say to you? And were you arrested? Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't arrested that day. I was. I did get a ticket. They threatened to arrest me an awful lot of times. Uh, so it started out with one cop, um, and then uh, two more showed up. And then another one showed up and, and um, it, we were there for an hour, maybe an hour and a half before uh, they finally decided that they were going to leave and let me sit there and finish handing out the, the potatoes. <laughs> so you're telling me um, that it took two police officers an hour to allow you to give away food to people who were hungry. No, no, it took four police officers wow. Uh, wow. to decide if they were going to arrest me or give me a ticket an hour to decide that they were going to uh, give me a ticket and uh, and leave me there to continue giving away the food. Wow, that's... I, 
that, that to me just seems inexplicable. Otto, drawing from your experience, why do you think small town police apply so much force to what could only be considered citation worthy offenses? Well, they get away with it. So a lot of small towns have, have a, a really high per capita police to, to citizen ratio. Uh, that that leads them to be bored a lot of times or just sitting around. So anytime that they have a opportunity and usually most people from small towns are fairly cooperative. You might have the, the uh, one off, you know, city cops are usually um, more used to people being vocal in, the, in opposition. So when you get pulled over by a small town cop and, uh, and they demand your ID for playing Pokemon Go, for example, um, exactly. they're not used to people uh, giving them any grief whatsoever. They just bend over and take it and they get away with it. That's why they, they feel like they can do it. You know, Otto, maybe you could share with me another example of what you think is over-policing and excessive force that you or your fellow auditors and activists have experienced. Oh, over-policing. Um, over-policing is fairly simple. Uh, there's just so many of them. I don't know what they do uh, throughout the day on a regular basis, but uh, on a lot of the, uh, the the traffic stops that we've observed, um, it'll start out with, with two cops. So there's two cops uh, in cars, two squad cars with cops in them, of course, um, for simple traffic stops. And then if somebody shows up to, to film it, then uh, they yes. call more cops. And then the next thing you know, there's two dozen squads and, uh, you know, and then somebody's got to go to jail because that's very expensive and it costs a lot of money and it's embarrassing. Uh, so, I mean, it, it just it snowballs from there. So, Otto, I've seen more and more people like you, auditors and activists, people who want to defend their constitutional rights, and they're armed with nothing but a camera to stand up police. Why do you think this is happening now? Why do you think so many people are standing up to police in this way with only a camera in their hands? Well, it's nothing new, is it? Um, uh, the, the people are standing up with a camera now because we have them. It's just because they're available. Before cameras, people were still standing up, but it's just not as well documented. Uh, in some cases, it is like the civil the civil rights uh, era. Um, you know, people were standing up and getting beat down and eaten by dogs and shot and pepper sprayed and everything else, just like they are today. Uh, the only difference is, is that now each individual has an opportunity to broadcast that to the entire world instantly, uh, and that's a, that's an empowering thing for the people and a scary thing for the government. Um, anytime that, uh, that the government is afraid of its people, we have freedom. And when the, when the people are afraid of the government, it's tyranny. Um, right now, we're kind of leaning toward that part where everybody's afraid of the government. Even police officers are afraid of other police officers. You know, they, they, they don't wanna have anything to do with them either. So that's kind of a sad uh, state of affairs is i'm sorry if, to interrupt you okay. it's kind of a sad state of affairs because uh there is definitely a place for police um but when you think of of what a, a police officer's job is you think solving crimes yes. and when you think of crimes i think of of, think of crimes with victims uh theft robbery um assaults of various kinds and things of that sort uh, I don't think of crimes as jaywalking, which uh, we uh, have m multiple people being arrested for all the time. Uh, we have we actually just finished a case for jaywalking in here. Um, flashlights, using words, upsetting somebody, holding signs, giving away potatoes. These are the things that, that the police are doing uh, that may give them a bad light and um, drive a further wedge between the people uh, that they're supposed to be serving. You know, Otto, what do you think it will take to make a real change in the way we're policed in this country? I would like to see the, the end of qualified immunity. Uh, that's where a police officer can do something illegal, but because he thought that it was legal at the time he did it, uh, he's, not, he, he's not held responsible. Um, if I was to do something illegal, not knowing that it was illegal, uh, I would come into, that would be arrested, first of all, right. which a police officer is rarely arrested. And then I would go to court and I would say, well, I didn't know. And the judge would say, I'm sorry, son, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Exactly. So why is it okay for me to get in trouble and my life be destroyed, but a police officer to uh, like, I mean, not being facetious here, murder you 
and then uh, and then get paid time off and uh, their psychiatrist is paid for. Right. I don't understand. Otto, Otto, that's an excellent point, and that's something we're going to take a look into into the police accountability report. We're going to take a look into qualified immunity. That's an excellent point. Otto, I want to thank you so much for your time. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be here. I appreciate what you guys do, and I hope you keep it up and do it every day and twice on Tuesdays. <laughs> thank you so much, Otto. We appreciate you. It was almost 70 years ago that then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower warned the public about a growing threat to democracy, the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower, a former World War II general, believed that the growing convergence between military contractors, Pentagon bureaucrats, and corrupt politicians would lead to the growth of a defense industry completely untethered to reality. And indeed, he was right. Think about it. The U.S. has spent trillions on endless wars. In fact, the money to pay for these eternal conflicts comes from special non-budget funds because the government doesn't want to account for them. The point is, despite growing income inequality, hundreds of thousands of medical bankruptcies, a healthcare system that gouges patients while producing mediocre results, the Pentagon budget continues to grow, and we continue to fight wars without end. Perhaps that's a message auditors are trying to send, a warning of sorts about the consequences of the unchecked growth of policing. In a sense, they are the collective canary in the coal mine, testing the fragile limits of police powers by revealing just how overwrought they are. And in doing so, revealing to us a truism about a system that's not only unjust, but unnecessary. How else can we explain the litany of arrests cited at the beginning of the show? How else can a government justify the expansion of a system that seems more aimed at extracting wealth than mitigating suffering? How else can they offer cops higher pay, lifetime pensions, health care, and other comforts, and then deny them to the communities they allegedly serve, but lavish on each other as if none of us is the wiser? Well, here at the Police Accountability Report, we are not blind to this unfolding reality. In fact, we are in the process of measuring just how much this expansion of policing is costing us all. It's a long-term investigative project, which we will share with you on the show in the future. But it's also an example of how journalism is supposed to work, to reference an old saying, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. To illustrate what I mean, take a look at this body cam video from Baltimore Police Officer Richard Pinero Jr. He was caught on camera planting evidence and then recording it on his body cam to send an innocent man to jail. Pinero was convicted on two counts of misconduct in office and fraud in 2018, but now, two and a half years later, he's still on the force earning a full salary. Why? Because police officers in Maryland, like many other states across the country, have extra protections from the laws that govern you and me. In this case, Officer Pinero cannot be fired until an internal investigation has completed his case. Never mind that a jury of citizens found him guilty of a crime. Never mind that he tried to put an innocent man in jail for a crime he didn't commit. It doesn't matter. He still gets paid. He still gets benefits. In fact, he's still earning his way into a lifetime pension. See my point about afflicting the comfortable? That's because despite all the rhetoric from police unions and law enforcement apologists about how beleaguered the police are, they are in fact not subject to the laws they enforce. They are apparently free to commit crimes and keep their jobs. It's a classic do what I say, not what I do scenario. But more importantly, another example of how the police in this country are fast becoming the Praetorian Guard, the protective Roman emperors and their fascist policies from pushback all for a price. The truth is, a democracy persists only as long as it's fair. Think of the one vote, one person principle, the idea that in the end, we all have a fair say in how we're governed. Without getting into how warped that concept has become, how can a democracy flourish when it's subject to the whims of a class of people, not only above the law, but empowered to unjustly enforce it upon others? And how can a civilized and free society survive when it concedes control over liberty to an institution that corrupts the very principle it's pledged to protect? That is the existential question we have to ask ourselves. How much leeway do we give police? And how much civic freedom are we willing to concede for a false sense of security? These are the questions we will continue to ask on this show, and these are the ideas we will continue to explore in depth to hold police accountable. I want to thank my guest, Otto the Watchdog, for talking with us today and sharing his experiences with small town policing. And I want to thank my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, for his invaluable reporting and writing. And of course, I have to thank friend of the show, Noli D, for her support. Hi, Noli. And I want you to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. 
please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. You know I read your comments and I appreciate them. I'm your host, Taya Graham, and I want to thank you for joining me for the Police Accountability Report. Be safe out there.